So I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Todd Morris, who will be talking about his experience adopting and using OER for his classes here at ISU. After graduating with his PhD in chemistry from the University of Alabama in 2004, Dr. Todd's, um, Dr. Todd Morris's teaching career began when he was hired as an assistant professor of chemistry at Adams State College in Alamosa, Colorado. After teaching for three years in Colorado and a two-year postdoctoral appointment at NIST in Maryland, um, Dr. Morris then taught chemistry at Lycoming College in Pennsylvania, Bucknell University in Pennsylvania, and the University of Mississippi in Mississippi over the next six years. Finally, in 2014, he was hired as an adjunct instructor in the Department of Chemistry here at Idaho State University. Two years later, he was hired by the department as a teaching assistant professor of chemistry. In 2019, Dr. Morris was awarded an open and affordable educational grant to investigate the use of OER materials in his courses. And more recently, in 2021, he was promoted to the title of teaching associate professor and was recognized as one of the university's five master teachers. So congratulations on that. Dr. Morris also coordinates the general chemistry labs and has been the assistant chair of the chemistry department for four years. In his free time, he enjoys birding, gardening, reading classical literature, and spending time with his wife and their five dogs. So I will now I, I turn it over. Yeah. Somebody there joining him. I'll now turn it over to Dr. Morris to tell us about his experience with OER. Thank you, Kimberly. Let me share my slides here. All right, thank you. Thank you for coming out and um, listening to my little talk here about um, my experience using open educational resources. And my focus today is I want to kind of take a a different approach. I, I've given a similar talk to uh, new faculty as well as other uh, instances where I focused on how is OER good for the faculty? How is it good for the instructor? Here I want to um, emphasize the student's perspective because ultimately, at least in my view, the kinds of decisions we make in terms of whether we go with OER, whether we go with a traditional textbook or traditional materials, whether we choose to allow students to use an older edition versus the newest edition, Ultimately, it's our students who are going to be impacted by those decisions. So I want to make sure that as instructors, we're also listening to our students. So to begin with here, kind of where I came from and how I became a textbook hero, or as my wife likes to refer to it as a bookstore villain, I've always been kind of just as a personality, kind of a saver personality, uh, more so than a spender, certainly. I've been always very value-minded, um, from a positive point of view, you could say that I'm frugal, um, or you might say that I'm, I'm, I'm a kind of a Scrooge in terms of you know, not one is a cheapskate, I guess, with kind of a negative way of looking at it. But that's just kind of my, my perspective of life is that I always value things. I want to make sure that if I do pay for something, that it is worth the cost that is involved there. Even when I got into higher education back in 2004 or so, I think I was always very hyper aware of the cost of higher education, not just simply the, um, the cost of tuition as, as, as Kimberly talked about in my bio, I've taught at relatively inexpensive state schools as well as very selective, so therefore very expensive um, private schools. So beyond just the tuition costs, which I have no control over, I was also, also very aware of what kind of additional cost am I, am I putting on my students? Um, in some cases, I really didn't have much choice. I was more or less forced or at least encouraged to use the same materials that have always been used for this picker course. Or if I was teaching a course where there were multiple sections, if I had a, another more senior instructor was using a particular course material, for example, like a clicker uh, for course participation points, I had to use the same material. And so therefore it cost my students that much more. Fortunately though, here at ISU, we have, I think, a lot more academic freedom in terms of what we're gonna actually use for our courses. So I've tried to take advantage of that and try to look at always minimizing those costs. Fast forward to about spring 2019, where I was awarded an open and affordable educational grant. Um, when I heard about this grant, I had no idea what OER was or what it even stood for, 
But as I learned more about it, as I got into the research, it seemed to be like a perfect match with kind of just my typical um, perspective and, pers and, and kind of what I want to do with, with my courses. And so I was, I was able to investigate it and look at the research. And then was very curious about, well, can I do this in my courses? And then what kind of in impact would that have on my courses? And so today's talk is largely looking at the impact of ultimately, at least originally, that open and affordable educational grant that started this whole process. A few months later, in the summer of 2019, I was teaching a chemistry um, two course actually. And that's when I started using the first time using an OER textbook for my general chemistry courses. And then the fall of that year, I started using an OER textbook for my other, my or, uh, baby chem, chem 1101 course, introduction to chemistry class. And so since summer 2019, I've been collecting uh, both objective data. So this would be uh, grades, final exam scores, uh, class GPA, as we'll see later, as well as subjective data from my students. So I would I post, I um, give my students surveys at the end of the semester. And these are optional surveys. These are surveys that I give them to, to allow them to earn some extra credit that gives me some feedback. And we'll see quite a bit of that data a little bit later, feedback on what they thought about OER um, in terms of whether they thought it was useful or not, how it compared to their use of other materials and other courses, et cetera. But I said, we'll get into those details a little bit later. My students, who are my students, or at least who were my students? My three courses, Chemistry 1101, Chemistry 1111, Chemistry 1112. Chemistry 1101 was the introduction to chemistry course. It was a course I taught for a total of four years. And it was a course that I had two sections in the fall and two sections in the spring. And all the sections will be very large, usually somewhere between 80 and 100 students per section. So it's very large enrollment, approximately 350 to as many as almost 400 students I would see annually. So I got to kind of rotate through quite a big um, population of our students. And it was a very interesting course. It was a fun course to teach, in part because the students that I taught, the kind of the makeup of my student, of the student body in the course, was very diverse. About half the students were taking it because they um, were on a nursing career path. And so they needed to take chemistry 1101 as the first of a couple of chemistry courses they needed to take, not only pass, but also do very well in. But the other half of the students, so those students were very highly motivated. The other half of the students, though, were simply taking the course to satisfy one of their general education requirements. And so these other students would come from probably not science necessarily, but business or English or art or music, just all over the campus, they would come into my class and just take my class to check off a box on their, their course degree and plan. And then there are a few um, students that were generally STEM majors, oftentimes even chemistry majors or biochemistry majors who know they needed to take Chemistry 111, the general chemistry course, but know they first needed a chemistry prep course. So it's a very diverse student uh, population and so they're kind of a fun class to teach. Whereas chemistry 111, 112, this is more general chemistry, more serious chemistry per se, it's also had very large enrollment courses. So currently I'm teaching one, one, court, one section of both chemistry one and chemistry two, both in the fall and the spring. And typically between those two semesters, those four sections total, I'll see about 200 students. These students course would be much more uh, STEM majors, typically bio, a lot of biology majors, engineering, biochemistry, chemistry, and then a couple of other majors that may just like chemistry or maybe actually taking this course as one of their general education requirement courses. So certainly the data that I'll present later, whether it's a survey data or other class data, is not fully representative of the entire population of ISU, but I think especially with chemistry 1101 information, it does give us at least a sampling of the other schools and the other, other departments and the other students that come from backgrounds or have interests other than just simply science or other than simply chemistry. So the solution is in a lot of ways to um, what I have been using of course, is, is OER, Open Educational Resources. And we can define OER in various ways, define it as teaching, learning, research materials that reside in public domain, release an open license that permits no act cost access, use, adaptation, and redistribution of others with no or limited restrictions. That's kind of the formal definition or one formal definition of OER. 
I like this definition that I kind of came up with that is a better definition, I think, for faculty, but also for students. So like if they know that a class is taking is using OER, what does that really mean? Well, for them, that means that it's going to be free and ideally comparable quality. And certainly this is where a lot of the debate with OER and the OER use comes from is, is can you get something for free that's worth as much, that, that, that has the most much value as something that, that costs quite a bit of money? So certainly, depending upon where you find it, there will be the quality will vary, but it's resources that could potentially, and I think at least should be investigated into possibly replacing the high cost, high quality resources that we traditionally require for our courses, but do cost our students some money. Open education resources I have been using is OpenStax uh, General Chemistry Textbook for my Chemistry 1 and Chemistry 2 courses, and then a textbook, an older edition textbook uh, for my introduction to chemistry courses, uh, the basics of general organic and biological chemistry. Certainly, this is not limited to just these two resources. There are other um, online resources. OER Commons is a nice repository of, or, uh, of, of different sources you can use. Uh, PHET is especially good for uh, science simulations. And there's even other resources you can find online that are sometimes they're, 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 they're made for other courses, science courses or math courses or English courses. They may specialize in particular types of OER, but some other course, some other uh, resources just have a whole list of a variety of types. What is the student's perspective? That's kind of where I want to go with this talk. Well, in my mind, if I were a student, and it hasn't been terribly that much long since I have been a student, as a student, I'm going to, going to college because I'm trying to ultimately earn a degree. And sometimes that's referred to as being simply getting an education, but I like to refer to it as investing in an education because ultimately the student is investing themselves. They're certainly investing money, tuition, as well as other costs, education. They're investing time. They're sacrificing both money and time that they could be using for other purposes. So they're investing in the hope that that investment will pay off. They'll be able to earn a degree, which will then be able to give them an ideally high paying job. So in order to earn that degree, they need to succeed in all their required and elective courses. That starts, of course, with choosing this school. Within the school, once they're now enrolled in school, they're going to choose their instructors, if at all possible. And then once they're now enrolled in a particular class, they get to see what the course materials and resources are for that class. And then they have to decide whether I need to invest in those course materials and resources. And so from my perspective, if a, if a student thinks that the um, course materials and resources are worth that investment, those materials and resources will have at least three criteria. One, is that they'll be relevant. Two, is that they'll be useful. And three, um, something that I think I've learned the most from this process, uh, especially with my survey, is that the course materials and resources have to be worth the cost. So if there is a cost to the materials, then they need to be worth that cost. And we'll talk about what I kind of mean by cost. So first, that course materials should be relevant. But when I always recommend or even require a particular course material, whether it's a textbook or homework or other um, ancillary material, I always ask my question, is this a good resource? Because ideally, I want this resource, whatever it is, to complement what I'm teaching my students in the class. And so the first thing you might look at is, well, you know, will this OER textbook that I choose or the students get, get to use, does it cover the same material as the traditional textbook? And this is a sampling of the chapters that are typically covered in Chemistry 1 for the traditional textbook, and then the sampling of the basically the same chapters that are covered from the OER textbook for the course. And even if you don't have any background in chemistry and all this looks like a foreign language, we can all agree that we use for a lot of these situations, we have the same words there. So we can kind of agree that they probably cover the same material. This is what we see in Chemistry 1. Same thing we see with Chemistry 2 actually lines up even better in terms of the chapters, the chapter content of the traditional textbook versus the OER textbook. So it definitely should be a relevant as a resource to cover the same material I'm covering in my lecture. And both textbooks um, do that. As importantly though, is that they should be relevant in that if I do invest in this particular course material, I wanna make sure that if I spend $50 or even $10 or $100, I want to make sure that I get 
$10 or $50 or $100 out of this textbook and or this course material. And so a lot of times students will decide whether or not to buy a textbook based on whether an instructor says that it's required or not. Because the implication is that if it's required, then that means that without this textbook, I can't be successful. And if I can't be successful in the course, then that's going to hurt my investment in my overall edu uh, college, education, uh, college education. So what I found though, and this is not terribly surprising just from talking to students and just kind of overhearing some of their, their talks among themselves and complaints amongst themselves sometimes, is that when I surveyed my chemistry level one class, 95% of the students said that at least one time they found that they purchased a textbook that was required and never actually needed it. Um, whether that meant they never actually opened it or not, or they just simply didn't get a whole lot of use out of it, whatever it is, they simply didn't think it was required. They didn't really think it was required as the instructor thought it was required. I asked a similar question to my chemistry uh, 111 and 112 students, my chemistry one and two students. It was a little bit different in that I asked how often did they regret purchasing required course materials? So these are materials that the instructor said were required, how often did they regret it? And we can look at our pie chart here and it says that within my survey, that over half the students very often, more than 60% of the time, found that they regretted uh, purchasing course materials and about 75% of them either regretted very often or about half the time. So relatively few of our students, according to our survey, are actually happy, ultimately in the end, at the end of the semester, happy that they purchased their course materials that were said to be required. It really hit home a lot of these, these ideas, such as relevance, such as, as well as the other ideas. We'll end with a couple of quotes. And these are quotes from that survey where I asked them about what their opinions were of free textbooks and just how the use of free textbooks would impact their lives. So this student says that, I found that a lot of times you purchase a book and then find out you don't need it. It's super frustrating to how much money you spend on it. The majority of textbooks I purchase, I only use maybe twice. If courses use a free textbook, they would feel better about it because even if they didn't use it, they wouldn't feel upset because they didn't spend hundreds of dollars on it. So it was a resource that was available, it was free. You didn't put much into it. So even if you didn't get much out of it, there's no harm done. And then a lot of times, this, this sums up another uh, opinion of a lot of students is that sometimes they feel like money spent on textbooks is a waste and they don't, a lot of times they don't use them. That's very frustrating. So they invest the money at the beginning of the semester and at the end of the semester, yes, maybe they're successful in the course, but then looking back in hindsight, they realize they could have been equally successful without the textbook. So material should be also useful. So what do I mean by useful? Well, of course, comparing the two textbooks, traditional and, te and the OER textbook, certainly the physical size of a physical copy of textbook might prevent its use because you might not want to be able to lug it around campus just because of its heavy uh, its heft. Whereas OER textbook is an ebook, so you can download it on your phone. You can always view it online. Of course, the cost available, the cost for the traditional textbook versus the OER textbook. And what's nice, at least about OpenStax, um, which is oftentimes a complaint of students of using OER, is that yes, they like OER, but they don't like necessarily using ebooks. At least with OpenStax, you also have a physical copy that's also available if they want to purchase a physical copy. More importantly, though, is as a resource, if it's useful, what does it look like beyond the cover? And so here are two pages of basically the same content of the traditional textbook and the OER textbook. And without knowing any more information, I think all of us would be hard pressed to decide which one was worth $240 and which one was free. It turns out that in this case, the one on the left is the $40 textbook. The one on the right is the free textbook that's available uh, online for anybody. So the, the, the presentation, the course material, the, the, the content of the textbook, in my opinion at least, is essentially identical. And I think at least in my opinion, the OER textbook is a better match with the topics that I teach and the level that I teach it at um, in my courses. Another sort of side um, benefit I think of, of at least OpenStax in terms of as an OER resource is that these OER resources, they're not perfect. There aren't any textbooks, even on my library shelf, that are perfect. But what's nice about, at least with OpenStax, is that it's very simple that if you do find a mistake, or if you think something could be worded a little bit different, it's very easy to fix that, or at least very easy to submit a um, errata for the other for the editors to consider fixing it. And this is actually a real example of even last semester, where 
a student who obviously read the textbook very carefully, they found that there were some mistakes in the OpenStax version. They sent me some um, screenshots. I took a look at those screenshots, realized that these were pretty major mistakes. I sent that even the very day, sent a errata submission to OpenStax. This is a screenshot of that errata submission. And then they said that, okay, a few weeks later, I checked on it and they said, okay, yes, we agree that's a mistake and we'll fix it starting next semester. Well, they were truthful in that last semester, fall 2021, this is what that same part of the textbook looked like. You can kind of see it says uh, form according to the equation, colon is this blank information. And then we have a textbook example. So there's obviously missing text here. Now that same page now has all this information. So all of this additional information was now fixed because my student found that mistake and we were able to fix it. So not only was that able to then uh, make it more useful for our students as they continue to use the same textbook, but for all the other students that are using textbook can benefit from this one, my one student finding and fixing this mistake. And then finally though, in terms of usefulness is that as a resource, the idea is that using a textbook should, should improve their um, chances of success in the course. And this is a uh, class GPA chart. Uh, the first two years of uh, teaching chemistry 1101 using the traditional textbook versus the last two years using the OER textbook. And you can see just from just the, uh, the variability here that it doesn't seem to be much difference in terms of the average class GPA of traditional textbook versus OER. And then even with statistics, the numbers are the same. So at least in terms of my experience, and this is not necessarily true for everyone, but at least in my experience, there was no significant difference between the class success rates using the traditional versus the OER. And of course the OER set is a free textbook versus the hundreds of dollars for the traditional textbook. These uh, course materials should be useful in that, just as a survey, you know, how well did my students actually use my, my OER textbook versus traditional textbook? And this is one of the more surprising results because I thought that as a free textbook, because they didn't put anything into the textbook, maybe they won't get anything out of it. Maybe it's just a free source and free, free, free source and they don't use it. Well, it turns out, at least from the survey, that at least half of them found they used the same as a traditional textbook. And about a third of them said that they actually used it more than the traditional textbook. So kind of surprising results there. And I think some of these quotes went to um, the, the rationale, the explanation behind that. So this person said that they actually used the free textbooks more because they don't buy required textbooks if they have to buy one. If there's questions in the textbook, they just use friends. So all they're using the textbook for, if they have to purchase it, is just for the questions at the, at the end of the chapter. But if it's a free textbook, it's a resource that they can actually pick up and use at any time. The student says they could find information elsewhere, but because the book was free, they actually it's a they actually used it because they didn't have to invest anything in it, but they were able to get a lot out of it. They're more likely to use this one. The random one's even still expensive. And this is one of my favorite quotes is that the student says that even when a purchased textbook, they tend not to use it. They just tend to put it on a shelf so that in the end, the end of the semester, they can return it in top shelf or top shape or sell it. So they're trying to um, sort of gain a system of reselling their textbooks in good shape by not using the textbook because they're trying to minimize that overall cost of the textbook. And then finally, the course material should be worth the cost. And so certainly what is the cost of these textbooks? This is something that I think even with the survey, I was even more aware of how much these textbooks are costing our students. And so with Chemistry 1101, one question was just kind of on average, how much they spend. About half the students said they spent somewhere between $204 per semester. And then a slightly different question for regards to my Chemistry 1 and Chemistry 2 um, survey, also kind of basically the same thing, roughly about, at least in my experience, about $300 per semester is what the students are um, saying they're spending just on ancillary course materials, whether they're required or recommended, these are just additional costs these students are incurring. That kind of gives an idea of what the, the cost is, but what is the impact of that cost? Certainly, when you think about the cost of textbooks, what a lot of us go to immediately is just, okay, the cost of textbooks is just another item on their budget, and so they may have to, you know, have other, not have as much vacation time, or may have to work more, or has other things they have to do in order to make up for this cost. Certainly, that's what a lot of these quotes come from, or, or talk to speak to. This quote talks about having more stressed, um, especially at the beginning of the semester. If they weren't as stressed, 
then they could more better focus on their studies. Um, beginning of the semester is always overwhelming because these are oftentimes unexpected costs. They sometimes get hit at the beginning of August, beginning of January with these additional costs that they necessarily weren't planning for. They have emotional toll as well because they're always worried about spending so much money. Once again, they're trying to decide, trying to make the best decision for themselves as whether an investment in the textbooks and other materials is worth the cost of it or, or could they spend that money better elsewhere. They have less anxiety. Textbooks allow them to sleep at night, and at least the students said that they could eat. Um, certainly, a little bit of exaggeration there, but I think it gets to the point of these textbooks are costing our students some money, sometimes quite a bit of money, and that they don't necessarily have, and they sometimes have to make these sacrifices. So, certainly, this is kind of what you want to come to mind when you think of what is the cost of these um, traditional textbooks or traditional course materials versus OER the stress, the emotional toll, and of course, the budgetary constraints. But I think also this second set of quotes, I think really gets at a, when you, as important. Uh, this student says that if they had cheaper or free textbooks, that would actually give them more time to study and they could actually do better in the courses because they won't have to work as much. So this student realizes they have these textbooks they need to purchase, they need to afford these textbooks, so they have to work more and therefore have less time to study and otherwise do well in school. The student has said that, with free textbooks, I can use that extra, uh, otherwise uh, use money for tutoring or other resources like a computer. So once again, helping their education beyond just the textbooks. Students said that they would be more, more than willing to get not just simply required one, but even the recommended ones if the textbooks were free or inexpensive. That would probably lead to more in-depth learning. So our students would be learning more even beyond just simply the required portions of the course if the textbooks didn't cost as much. And this student said, I think this also is true for a lot of our students, that they'll be willing to take more classes. A lot of times, from the survey at least, the students said they were limited in how many classes they could take, not based upon how much time they have, but simply based upon their budget in terms of how much these textbooks are going to cost. So they might be willing to take more classes, even more elective courses, to expand their horizons, to get a broader, more in-depth education. These course, so in conclusion then, these course materials and resources, they should be relevant. So at least in my experience, and this is not necessarily true for everyone, but at least in my experience, the OER and traditional textbooks cover the same material and at least to the same quality. So either one is fine, OER course is free. I think as faculty, we do wanna be careful with our terms required versus recommended. Um, if we say required, we really wanna make sure that means you have to have this material or else you have a very low chance of being successful in the course. It needs to be useful. The OER is, at least in my survey, used at least likely as much, if not more, which is kind of surprising. At least in my experience, the core success metrics, PA, final exam average, et cetera, seem to be unaffected based upon the textbook, and it need to be worth the cost. So we want to keep in mind that the cost goes beyond the finance, financial impact of the textbook, has other emotional and stress costs as well. And also, at least from that last set of, of, certain, of quotes, as faculty, by minimizing the cost, we may in fact maximize the education because that gives students some opportunities to spend that money for other things that may enhance our education, whether it's other, other materials, more classes, computers, tutoring, they can get more out of their education if we can minimize the cost on the front end. So if this piqued your interest, then I recommend that at least these three resources for the investigation. And I can assure you that these three resources, certainly not exhaustive, but these three, three resources are all relevant, they're useful, and they're certainly worth the cost. So I'd be happy to take any questions you may have. Thanks, Todd, Thanks. appreciate that. If anybody has questions or um, comments to add, feel free to unmute yourselves and go ahead and ask those right now. Hi, Todd. Uh, yes. Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, I have a one question for you. Um, so um, in your case, uh, you were able to use the uh, state uh, funding and initiative funding uh, for you to look at a lot of materials during the summer, isn't that correct? Yes, yes. Yeah. So. Um, did you feel like that resource was uh, obviously useful, but you know, uh, was enough for you to spend 
you know, uh, a significant amount of your own time to look at a bunch of different um, resources and I guess take that, you know, plunge after uh, mm -hmm. looking at a bunch of uh, uh, open source materials. I, I definitely, I definitely think so. It was, um, I said, in hindsight, you know, I think I would have done the same thing even without the grant. I think it was just, just this um, catalyst to say, okay, we have these resources available, and then here's a little bit of money to um, to inspire to motivate me to actually look at this more seriously. Um, so it ultimately didn't, at least in my perspective, it didn't take a whole lot of time to find these resources to to look at them and to ensure that they seem to be of equality and to um, you know, from my perspective, invest in these OER resources and then switch to these OER resources um, because I, I was confident that by doing so, I wasn't sacrificing the educational quality of my classes. Um, so I think that the money there was good. It was, it was a good motivation for me, um, but it was certainly um, plenty of money in terms of my time in, in, in order to investigate these resources. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, go go ahead, Laura. Hi, Laura. This is Todd. I'm at the library, and I'm curious. Yes. Um, how did you insert your textbooks into Moodle? Do you do it like at at the beginning of the course, and then they just refer to the text when you point them there, or do you insert chapters as you go along? What has worked best? So uh, both the, the OER textbooks that I use are just um, online resources. So they're just going to a web, a link to a website essentially allows them to access the, the, um, the course material, the textbook from there. I know, so I, so I didn't have to do much beyond just simply, you know, link it onto the on Moodle. I put it in the syllabus and then the students can access it from there. Um, I do know that with OpenStax, and I'm not sure if you can do this with Moodle. And one of the other things that's nice about OpenStax is that you can actually um, take the OpenStax textbook and you can modify it to even, you, you can put your own wording in there, you can delete and add, you, you can actually kind of change it as you like. Um, and that's something I think you do through your LMS. Um, but as, and I haven't done that because I, as far as I know, I'm not sure that's possible to do with Moodle. I know, at least from what I can see in OpenStax, they talk about instructions for Blackboard and for um, some other LMS um, systems, but I don't think, and I may be wrong, but I don't think we could do that with Moodle yet. Maybe that's something that um, can, be, can be worked on on our end, because that would be kind of nice to give them even like my own textbook, which is the OER textbook, but it's, it's very relevant in that it just contains the material that it will be covering in the lecture because oftentimes students will, will read some of the textbook and they'll say, you know, you didn't talk about this in the lecture. Is it on the test? Right. Because that's all they're concerned about. Is it on the test? And I try to explain it's like, well, at least in my courses, you know, I only um, expect you to be responsible for what I lecture on. Mm -hmm. Anything additional in the textbook is just additional materials. It, it's not, you're not going to be tested on it, but it never hurts to read about it, it never hurts to learn about it. Because once again, that expands your horizons. Um, makes you a better student, makes you a better uh, chemistry student, certainly. So if I were, if I did have the time and did have the, uh, the uh, potential, then I might look into um, taking that OER textbook and then even modify it even further. And then it would be something that would be connected to my Moodle um, so that students would click on uh, Moodle yeah. link to a particular chapter, which has been changed um, based upon my, my, my lectures. So maybe I can um, follow up a little bit with that. Uh, I'll ask our system admins to see if it's if there's a plugin that we can incorporate in order to get like even that direct linkage to happen right to the specific source um, mm -hmm. into Moodle. But with my previous experience using press books for a class that I taught and I used Canvas. I would link, like when I do my weekly modules, I would link my chapter or chapters for the week in the module and then it pointed them out, but it took them directly to the chapter. And so I think there's a way, even without maybe a, a plugin that would make it really easy, um, there's a way I think to get students to directly to the resource 
without too much trouble. Okay. Okay, I have one uh, one last question. Okay. Um, were there are there interactive components? Are there things about the OER textbook that you liked better than the traditional print? version and I'm imagining that might be some interactive elements. Mm -hmm. What have you discovered? Yeah, so as a because uh, one difference, important difference of course, is that the at least in my comparison, the traditional textbook was just a physical textbook, whereas the OER textbook is at least for the most part a online ebook. And um, what OpenStax did, I think and does well is they do incorporate a lot, they take advantage of the fact that it is an online resource. And so there's mm -hmm. lots of hyperlinks to whether it's a uh, relevant YouTube video, whether it's like one of those uh, PHET uh, simulations where they just click on it and then it can go to, it, it could jump from like a static picture of some sort of um, conceptual idea we're trying to communicate to, for example, with PHET, some sort of uh, simulation. So they can see the actual molecules and atoms moving and how that actually explains what we can observe um, in, in real life. And so it takes it, so it, it tries to, I think it does a good job of maximizing its use as a ebook. And probably, and I, I haven't, I know there's lots of other traditional books um, that are also ebooks as well. And I, I imagine that those books also kind of do a similar thing. But of course, the difference is that, so your textbook is, is always free for our students and they're not having to purchase. And it's always free and it's always available. Whereas a lot of times uh, with these um, ebooks that they purchase, or they rent, it may only be available for the semester, for the year. And then they don't have that same textbook that they can then go back to if they're studying for an MCAT or studying some, some sort of professional um, test that they need to review their general chemistry, they no longer have that textbook. And so they have to, um, they may not have their, their, their lecture notes anymore. So they may have to go to another resource which they didn't originally learn it from, which I think hurts them as well. Mm. Thank you. So I just did a quick search on integrating OpenStax into Moodle, and it looks like for some textbooks, it doesn't say for all of them, mm -hmm. but they have course cartridges that can be imported into Moodle okay. as well. So it can be done. So I guess if, if you're working on a course or with instructors on a course, um, then we'd be happy to look into importing the course cartridge so that they can get their textbook right into their class. And that includes ancillary materials, not just a textbook. So. Excellent. That's good news. Any other questions for Todd or comments? Okay, well, thank you for joining us today. We appreciate it. And thank you, Todd, for being here and being willing to talk about your experience. And I think when it comes to OER, it is, it's a challenge, but it's worth the effort to put into serving students in this way, because as we know, textbooks are not getting less expensive, they're getting more expensive year by year. So it's a good opportunity for us to look into things that we can do to improve that. Yes, thanks for sharing. And thanks for sharing the statistics and doing that follow-up research. I really appreciated that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, that's valuable, I think. Yeah. Good eye-opening information, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, well, join us for the next session. I believe it begins at 1 p.m. if you want to listen to another textbook hero presentation. And then we'll have um, an additional two additional sessions. So watch the the web page that, that the, the blog post has all of the links and all of the sessions and the bios for everyone that's presenting. So um, some good things to look forward to if you have the time. Thank right. you. Thank you. Bye. Yes, thanks for being here, everyone. Have a great rest of your day.